here to talk about this book, which is Galileo's Dialogue. This apparently is a big deal. It was meant to be read. It was written in Italian and not in Latin, hoping for a much wider readership. Um, it wasn't the first time that he was publishing his discoveries. The discoveries he made using the telescope that he had also made, these were published in 1610, and there was a lot of protest about it at the time. Um, I think the point about the 1610 book is that the discoveries he reported with sketches showed that the solar system had to have could be best represented as heliocentric rather than Earth-centered. One of the problems that the Church faced in the previous century was the calendar, and predicting the date of Easter. And Easter was off by 10 or 11 days. And so what the Church did is, in modern terms, we would say they appointed a commission to look into yes. the question of calendar um, renovation. And Copernicus was trying to find a numerical way of predicting the date of Easter. He wasn't trying to upset the apple cart. <laughs> but in fact, what he had was a, a clever but very cumbersome way of calculating with a series of epicycles, one circle nested on another and nested on another. And that wasn't immediately taken up, everybody liked it. Um, but there were other astronomers who worked on that, Tycho Brahe in Denmark, and also um, Johannes Kepler, who made some discoveries, and particularly on the geometry, the shape of the orbits. So this was in the air. People were discussing, looking for different models of the solar system, what could they represent, and in particular, from a practical point of view, what about the um, prediction of the date of Easter? And that was very important. So this book is not the one where he first announces that he's discovered a bunch of new moons around Jupiter or other things that he observes through the telescope. This is, this is a different sort of book. That's correct. Um, he put this in the form of a dialogue. We had three people talking with one another and bringing in some of the new ideas, but the really new stuff had already been published uh, many years before mm -hmm. with sketches and everything else. Mm -hmm. And that brought a warning from the church, um, look, you can deal with these things, but you have to deal with these ideas hypothetically. What does this mean hypothetically in this case? What does that mean that he had to do? Well, he had to say that this was all hypothetical, this wasn't the absolute truth. So, you know, he engages in observational astronomy, and, um, but he has to put the Copernican system, and, and you know, we have to remember that Copernicus published his great work in 1543, so this is considerably later. We're almost 100 years, we're almost, 85 years later. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So what does Galileo do? I mean, one of the reasons this book is so important, uh, as Michael was saying, is it's in dialogue form, so it's accessible. It's a kind of commedia dell'arte of the philosophy. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comedy of philosophy. And Does it have it, characters? It has three characters, and um, it has puns and irony, and each character is actually a kind of masked figure. So Salviati is the mask for Galileo's own view, mm. and Segredo is, is a kind of mask for the layman, and Simplicio is the sort of simpleton mask for his enemies, um, mm. most likely we're talking about Ludovico delle Colombe, who was part of what Galileo called the Pigeon League. Mm -hmm. And these were his staunch enemies who opposed moving the Earth out of the center of the solar system and putting the sun there, which is what Galileo tries to do. So one of the things I think, John Heilbrunn has done a beautiful job in his most recent biography, talking about the fact that Galileo in this very accessible dialogue that virtually anyone could read who was literate, obliterates the distinction between celestial mechanics and terrestrial physics. And that is a very controversial thing well, to do. Well, this is a rule in physics, right? The rule in physics is, is, as I remember it from a long time ago, is that every all the rules we observe here apply everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like physics is the same throughout the universe. Is that no, but that was first really explicitly stated by Newton, Newton. in his mm -hmm. Principia. Mm -hmm. okay. um, one of the, he has the rules, the laws of motion, but he also has rules of reasoning and philosophy, an important section of the book. Wow. And that, the idea that, the laws are, that there are laws which are universal, this was revolutionary. And saying that the, yeah. law, the laws in the celestial mechanics are the same as the ones we observe on, on Earth uh, could, get, could get kind of awkward if you were doing a little bit more than just predicting when Easter was going to fall. Yeah, but all of these things, when you say predict, 
the um, prediction was geometric. Mm -hmm. There was no question of law of motion, law of gravity. Nobody was thinking of those. Mm -hmm. First of all, before Newton mm -hmm. introduced the idea of gravity, the purpose was could you predict and predict accurately when Easter would fall? And you could have more or less complicated geometries to do it. That didn't tell you what the world was really about. So you told me once that Galileo had already been warned. I mean, he, yeah. he'd been told that something like this would be a bad idea to yeah. publish. So what do people think now? Why did he do it? Just because it was true and he had to? or Well, I, if I could just yeah. I interject here. I mean, um, Heilbrunn, in, in this most recent biography, dedicates two chapters to the episode of the dialogue. The first chapter is... Uh, titled Miscalculated Risks, and oh. the second is, cal is titled Vainglory. And in some ways, that summarizes exactly what the problems were for Galileo. He's 52 years old when, he's, when the injunction mm. comes down, and he's told, you may not talk about Copernicus, you may not teach Copernicus, you may not discuss it even in private, um, but he's obdurate, he's impatient, and uh, he proceeds to write uh, a dialogue in which um, the enemies to Copernicanism are made to look like idiots. The other thing is that, you know, the Pope who ends up condemning him, Urban VIII, yeah. who's Maffeo Barberini, yeah. um, and was a poet, he was the poet pope, um, he was a great friend of Galileo yeah. originally. And actually, in this long poem he wrote, uh, dedicated two uh, stanzas to a celebration of Galileo's no idea. scientific yeah. innovation. And it's the same pope who Galileo um, offends so badly with this dialogue that ends up condemning him for heresy. Well, I was going to point out something in the book itself here. We have the usual you know, presentation of 17th century titles and everything here. And we have the whole thing laid out, a very long title, because you know they couldn't ever come up with a short one, um, and a dedication. Um, and then the statement, con, uh, con privilegi, um, which is the equivalent, all thing, uh, other things being equal, of copyright. At least it's, uh, it, it's an assertion that no one else has the right to print this book. And then um, in the back here, we have all these statements that, are imp that all begin imprimatur, you know, let it be printed. And they are signed by people whose um, names begin things like a episcopus. Well, that's an archbishop, I think. So clearly some church authorities mm -hmm. approved of this at one time. He was able to get it printed. What happened or how, why did he get it printed? How, how did he manage that? And then what happened later? One of the added complications was the Thirty Years' War, which was going on, and that wasn't the case. Um, I don't think that had started yet by 1616. So it was a complicated fact of something that the Pope had to deal with, um, which was not part of the original um, background. But he got so, approval, yeah. and then yeah. nonetheless, and the approval dates yeah. from 1630, mm -hmm. yeah. and nonetheless... Right, he submitted it to the church censors, and they told him he needed to change the title, which was originally On the Tides because tides are so controversial. Well, they, tides are controversial? They, they are controversial mm -hmm. because they are, if you believe in tides and you believe in the force of the moon, then you're on the Copernican side of things. In part, it is the fact that people carefully read it. And it oh. is so clearly uh, a, a manifesto in support of Copernicanism. And the representation of the opposing side, the peripatetic Aristotelian Thomist um, view, uh, is is made so much fun of that uh, it it was seen as a great offense and uh, a deliberate um, disobedience in with respect to the injunction. Sure. So do you think that maybe they they gave the approval and then and only afterwards they they read what they had approved? Probably to and some were extent. Horrified. Yes. Or they may have read it and felt that it wouldn't give offence because the facts were already known for quite a few years before. Mm -hmm. So. And, and the other thing yeah. is we have to remember, you know, we're this is the Counter Reformation and the Church is very very. Um, uh, on the defense, yeah, protecting... The, the, the Counter-Reformation, the period when the church is worried about 
the Reformation and trying to figure out how it needs to reform, if it needs to reform, to um, on its own terms. So any scientific theory, natural philosophical theory, that contradicts scripture is, and, and especially so overtly, is a grave problem. You cannot contradict Mother Church, and that comes straight out of the decrees of the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. And uh, Galileo is given this injunction, and this is a bald-faced contradiction. Okay. This is a book that really represents a watershed in terms of the opposition of scientific authority to church authority. And even though the scientist lost, science wins. Um, and you know, the scientist is not redeemed actually until 1992 when Pope John Paul II mm -hmm. said we were wrong to condemn Galileo. I mean, it took from 1732 to 1992 for uh, his reputation to be rehabilitated in the context of the Catholic Church. But uh, science wins with this. And, um, but Italian universities didn't. But Italian universities didn't. And in fact, you know, for nearly 100 years, Italy becomes a backwater um, for cultural and scientific innovation. It has a terrible um, effect on intellectual innovation, engagement, and it's very isolating for Italian universities. I think we have to remember also that the church had an enforcement agency, namely the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was something you didn't mess around with at all. And I think it's very interesting that Roberto Bellarmine uh, was the same man who oversaw the burning at the stake of Giordano Bruno for heresy. And he is the one who meets with Galileo and indicates that there's an injunction against the teaching of Copernicanism and silences this. So it's the same inquisitor. There's another fact about this book that it has uh, an additional afterlife. People still read this, I understand. Right, and, and actually in, in a literary context. So there is probably not an anthology of Italian literature that doesn't feature excerpts from the dialogue, which is quite extraordinary. And that's because, you know, Galileo was a great writer, a masterful writer of comedy. And this truly is comedy. And so I, when I teach my survey of modern Italian literature, we begin with the dialogue. And it anchors students historically, um, but it also gives students a real sense of the power of dialogue in the vernacular, even in the 1600s, um, for conveying ideas. One of the nice things about uh, the collection here at Washington University is that it is open to people who come in and look at items in our reading room. So if you would like to read Galileo's dialogue, you can just come in and ask them to go down to the vault and get it for you. So with that, I'd like to say thanks to um, Professor Friedlander and Professor Messbarger, and uh, thank you for watching and remind you that uh, your library has treasures. <laughs>